Kwame Nkrumah was a Ghanaian political theorist and revolutionary who as Prime Minister of the then Gold Coast guided the country to independence in 1957. At independence, he became the first Prime Minister and President of Ghana from 1957 to 1966. But Nkrumah was overthrown in a military coup on the 24th of February 1966 while out of the country and was forced to remain in exile for the rest of his life. He was unable to return to the nation he had guided to independence and governed for almost 18 years as he was a man wanted in his country, dead or alive. The government placed a bounty of over $120,000 over his head for whoever would bring him back to Ghana. But Nkrumah was granted asylum in Guinea by Guinean President Ahmed Sekoutoure, who declared him co-president of the Republic of Guinea. Nkrumah remained in Conakry until his death on the 27th of April 1972. But far from his original home and his adopted home, Kwame Nkrumah passed away in Bucharest in Romania. The cause of his death was believed to be prostate cancer. For a man of immense influence, his death was a lonely one, devoid of ceremony and grandeur. Soon after his death, his body was returned to Guinea, where he lived until his last day. This was to mark the beginning of a long dispute between the Ghanaian leader, Colonel Ignatius Akiampon, and Guinean President Ahmed Sekoutoure over the final resting place of the former Ghanaian president. In this edition of Hispanic Media, we revisit the day Kwame Nkrumah died and the intrigues that resulted in this great African leader being buried three times. Please come with me, Gabriel here. Don't forget to leave a like on this video and consider subscribing to Hispanic Media for more interesting African history stories. Thank you. Ordinarily, the death of one of Africa's most prominent figures would have generated a polite response from the two major parties involved. Guinean President Ahmed Sekoutoure, who granted Kwame Nkrumah political asylum after his removal from office in 1966, and the leader of Ghanaian junta, Colonel Ignatius Akiampon. Instead, a serious dispute erupted between the two leaders over the final resting place for the former president's body. While Colonel Akiampo wanted Nkrumah's remains repatriated to Ghana, where, according to him, the former president would be given a befitting burial. The Guinean president wanted to retain the body in Guinea. Meanwhile, Madame Elizabeth Inyaniba, the aged mother of the late president, made an emotional plea to President Torre to let the body of his son repatriated to Ghana. According to her, I want to touch the body of my son before he is buried or I die. She also stated that she would like her son's remains to be embalmed and permanently displayed in public, similar to how Lenin's body is preserved. However, President Ahmed Sekoutoury would not consent, at least not until he won significant concession from Ghanaians that would benefit him personally. And because the Romanians had delivered a body to Conakry, Torre was in a strong position to set conditions. And this was exactly what he did. Shortly after Nkrumah's death, media sources revealed that President Ahmed Sekou Torre had set four conditions for the return of the former president's body to Ghana. These conditions included the following. That Nkrumah should be rehabilitated in the eyes of Ghanaians and with all pending charges lifted. Second, all Nkrumah's party members still in prison in Ghana should be released. The thought was that the threat of arrest for Nkrumah's close allies who choose to remain with him in Ezar should be removed. And finally, that the Ghanaian government should grant an official welcome to Nkrumah's body with all the honors due to a deceased chief of state. On May 28, 1972, it was discovered that Torre had placed more conditions. The Guinean leader now wants Nkrumah's tomb to be placed in front of Ghana's parliamentary building as well as a reinstatement of all persons who had held ministerial appointment and top position in his civil service. This was more or less an attempt to bring back Nkrumah's regime through the back door, though without Nkrumah himself as condition to reclaim his body. 
Ahmed Sekutori implied that if these conditions were not met, the remains of Kwame Nkrumah would remain in Guinea. Unsurprisingly, Condel Ignatius Akiampon refused to bargain on such terms and continued to push the Guineans to allow the body to be returned to Ghana. But President Ahmed Sekutori argued that Guinea had the right to retain Nkrumah's body since he had been granted asylum in Guinea and designated a co-president of the Guinean Republic in 1966 when he was betrayed by the Ghanaian military who deposed him. According to him, Nkrumah has served as co-president of Guinea since 1958 when the two nations founded the Guinea-Ghana Union. Torres stubbornly refused to accept pleas from Nkrumah's family and the Ghanaian people as well as the demands of the Ghanaian government. But the dispute, which was considered unnecessary, was beginning to receive attention from both African and international press and the public. Finally, various African officials including President William Tolbert of Liberia, Siaka Stevens of Sierra Leone and General Yakubu Gowon of Nigeria attempted to persuade Ahmed Sekutore to return the body to Ghana in the interest of African dignity. But this was to no avail. It was soon reported by the West African press that Tore had eventually succumbed to their pleas. However, this was later proven to be unfounded. On Saturday, April 29, 1972, Nkrumah's body arrived Conakry from Bucharest in Romania. Thousands of party members assembled for the event occupied the eight-mile-long road from the airport to Conakry city center. After traveling for two and a half hours, the funeral cottage arrived at the Mountain de Pepo, where President Ahmed Sekutore was waiting with members of the diplomatic corps, other high-ranking Guinean officials, and members of the National Political Bureau. After a hard separation from her husband since 1966, Nkrumah's wife, Madame Fatia Nkrumah, arrived from Cairo with their three children on Sunday. Several PGD officials, including Secretary's wife, received her at the airport and drove her to the presidential residence where Tory welcomed her. Mrs. Nkrumah went to the Mason du People where her husband's body was on display before retiring to the president's vacation home in the neighboring town of Kamiyane. Later that day, representatives from other African nations also arrived. In addition, Fidel Castro, the Cuban Prime Minister, was scheduled to make a state visit to Conakry and was to be welcomed with ecstasy. On Monday, 1st of May, during Guinean government funeral for Nkrumah, Torre gave a one and a half hour long funeral oration at the Mason du People covering Nkrumah's life from childhood until his final days in Guinea. He focused on Nkrumah's education in the United States his involvement in the nascent pan-African groups in London and his rise to prominence in Ghana, which culminated in Ghana gaining independence from Britain in 1957 under his leadership. Ahmed Sekutore went further to declare, quote, He found himself on free soil in Guinea, co-president of the Republic, having been betrayed in Ghana. He continued, African unity became an unstoppable force with Nkrumah, this is the reason why this man of action and thought is an African and more importantly just a man rather than a Ghanaian. The ceremony was attended by a few other dignitaries from outside the continent as well. Late in the day, a five-member delegation from Ghana headed by Colonel Benny, a member of the National Redemption Council arrived in Conakry to attempt to persuade Tory to relinquish Nkrumah's body. But this was also to no avail. Meanwhile, in his own country, news of Nkrumah's death generated mixed reactions from Ghanaians, depending on where one's sentiments lay. While some grieved the death of Nkrumah, others were either remorseful or indifferent. Notwithstanding, shortly after the news reached Accra, the government promptly released an official statement. Even though the Ghanaian government was willing to accord Nkrumah the appropriate respect upon his passing, they emphasized that their public tribute to him, 
did not imply support for Nkrumah's policies or a rejection of the reasons behind his overthrow. Rather, it was a recognition of the significant contribution he had made to Ghana's independence. But the National Redemption Council and Kondel Akiampo took the wise decision to allow Nkrumah's loyalists to grieve openly and without intervention from the government. For that to this, the military junta fully welcomed the expression of regret in public. Following Nkrumah's death, May 19 was declared a public holiday and a national day of mourning, and was followed by a non denominational service held in an open space outside the state house in Accra. Many members of the diplomatic corps, a few traditional leaders, and members of the National Redemption Council attended the ceremony. But Condel Ignatius Akiampo was notably absent. There were also thousands of people from all walks of life, ranging from market women and barefoot peasants to people who had held important positions under Nkrumah. Many of these people were covered in traditional money attire and wept openly as they walked past the catafalque, which was covered in kente clothes and placed where Nkrumah's coffin would have been. On the 7th of July 1972, the body of Kwame Nkrumah was flown back to Ghana in a special Guinean Air Force plane. The military government of Akiampon ordered the Ghanaian flag to fly at half-mast until the former president is buried in Nkrofu, a village 300 kilometers southwest of Accra, where he was born. The return of Kwame Nkrumah's body marks the end of a protracted negotiation between the governing National Redemption Council in Ghana and President Ahmed Sekotore of Guinea. Kwame Nkrumah, who is known to have wished his body to be cremated and the ashes spread over Africa, was now a subject of intense dispute for the final resting place of the same body. He was finally led to rest in Nkrofull in Ghana on 11th of July 1972. But this was not to be all. In 1992, his remains were transferred from his previous resting place in the village of Nkroful to Accra, where he was finally buried in the Kwame Nkrumah Mausoleum. He is known to have been buried three times, first in Guinea, second in his village of Nkroful, and the third in Accra, Ghana, due in part to the dispute between Guinea and Ghana over his body and the unfriendly nature of the Ghanaian government at the time. But how did the death of Kwame Nkrumah affect politics in Ghana? Well, Nkrumah's disappearance from the African political scene is an event of capital importance, especially of course for Ghana. Since his ouster in 1966, the faint hopes of Nkrumah's return looms in the air in Ghana, especially for his teaming supporters. It has been established that Nkrumah continued to influence Ghanaian politics long after he was removed from office. Hence, the question, which was hardly discussed openly but always in the back of everyone's mind, was what would happen if he were to return? However, with his death, the current leaders can now breathe some relief as the chances of his return no longer exist. So, what is your thoughts on this? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Click this video here for a full story of why Jerry Lawrence staged a bloody revolution in Ghana. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Hispan Media if you have not done so already. And I will see you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.